This is CRM Audio, the Microsoft Dynamics CRM podcast, with George Dubinsky, Joel Lindstrom, and Sean, the CRM Hobbit Haver. This episode of CRM Audio is sponsored by Kingsway Soft. Their SSIS integration toolkit comes from lessons that they learned from working on many large-scale CRM data integration projects. Kingsway Soft has adapters for the entire Dynamics family, including CRM, GP, AX, SL, NAV, and also Dynamics Marketing, Parature, and non-Dynamics sources like Salesforce.com, Oracle, QuickBooks, and online cloud storage like OneDrive and Dropbox. Kingsway Soft brings you cost-effective, codeless integration development with unparalleled performance. Compared with other CRM integration options, they provide more features for a lower price. You can download a free trial from kingswaysoft.com. That's K-I-N-G-S-W-A-Y-S-O-F-T.com. We thank Kingsway Soft for their support of CRM Audio. Since we've last talked, I believe the the two updates for 2015 and 2016, the .1 updates, but their, their emails are starting to go out. They're, they're talking about, you know, customers that are on 2015, they're starting to get emails saying that they'll start to soon see in their office portal information on the update to, to move to 2016 if they want, but okay. no dates that, I, that we could really definitively say, here you go. You know? uh, first of all, I'd like to um, apologize to listeners, to all two of them. Uh, that uh, my take on Cortana uh, <laughs> and uh, labeling it as a as a demo gimmick. The one thing that I missed, and I probably should know better because uh, for my entire life, as far as I remember, I've been suffering from uh, severe short sightedness. Uh, it's been fixed by laser, but you know. Uh, uh, since grade two, I was wearing glasses for years and years. And um, I, I guess what I missed is that Cortana has a future, perhaps not so much as a tool that you talk to while driving, but as a additional disability assistance tool. So people with disability, ability to talk mm-hmm. to computer and do it sensibly. And so computer can talk back to you uh, and make suggestions or what's not. I guess it's a great tool. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. And that's something I hadn't really considered. But yeah, for people who are, who are visually impaired or otherwise you know, limited in their ability to type, I think it's a good thing too. But, yeah. but from a but from a true business perspective, it is not yet sophisticated enough to to be much more than a nicety or something that you could take advantage of on a Windows phone because Cortana on the iPhone is not much of a benefit in my opinion. You get the same kind of uh, d- digital assistant where it can note your preferences, tell you when your plane is leaving, tell you how long till you get home, things like that. But the fact that it's not uh, as integrated into the device, right. meaning you right. can't you can't say, hey, Cortana, you have to open the app um, up and do that. Now, it does still get proactive with the notifications because I know this because now that I have Cortana on my computer and Cortana on my, on my iPhone, mm-hmm. everything starts nagging me when it thinks I'm supposed to be going to work. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Hey, Joel, yeah. you you need to leave for work. It's you know twenty five minutes to get there, and and uh, it thinks it's kind of scary. It thinks I need to be going uh, going places like Chick fil A too. I don't know why. Yeah, my mine told me it would take eleven minutes to get to Bruce B Downs Boulevard, and um, I work at home, <laughs> and I I don't live on Bruce B Downs Boulevard. Right. So I'm like, okay. I guess I'm gonna have to drive and do a U-turn and come home, or I'm not sure. <laughs> I had a um, I had a uh, a stretch of time where I was in Atlanta for an extended period, and it started thinking that that was where I worked, but it didn't know the name of the business or whatever. It just called it undisclosed location, 
So it would say, Joel, 10 minutes to undisclosed location right. or un- unknown location. Right. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I've learned a lot more than I planned to in the last week about server-side synchronization with 2016. I think I've got over a week of tips of the day for this. So this has been a gold mine of tips of the day. And one of the things that, as we all know, there are uh, some bad experiences that people have had with server-side sync, especially in 2013, where mailboxes would get disabled and a, uh, I would say, a dearth of good ability to do tracing and things like that to know if if it was working or not working or things like that. And so the message that I had heard from the people like Microsoft product team were that they had fixed or think they've fixed a lot of those stability issues. But, you know, I'm I'm naturally cautious about that. But I've got to say, at least my experience in the last week, it wasn't all smooth sailing, but for the first time I can say that I have successfully seen an environment where everybody configured for server-side sync was successfully syncing and was not getting disabled. So I'm starting to think that what they told us is really accurate, that the stability has increased. They've also given us a step forward on the on the uh, metric side of things in that uh, you can download the mailbox information now which is again a little thing but it'll tell you uh, it'll tell you last time a mailbox is synchronized and things like that which is a lot better than what we had even with 2015 update one and, and earlier the funny thing though is if you go to your mailboxes and this reminded me, George, of I think it was the view you showed of where you could show like errors that have happened in the future kind of thing. It has the um, the last time it synced, but it's in GMT. So I was looking at, at 3 p.m. on February 9th. Or I was showing showing my my client. It, here's how you look at the at the log to see what happened. The when's the last time mailbox is synchronized? And it said 7 p.m. February 9th, and he 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 asked me, how does it know it's going to synchronize four hours from now? It was yeah. it was quite funny. I told him that it's 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 using Azure machine learning, and so it's 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 using predictive analysis to know if it's going to successfully synchronize tonight. <laughs> uh, what about uh, the issue or challenge you've been having with the? dashboards becoming kind of useless on a large volume of mailboxes. Yes, that that is still an that is still an issue. And I believe I may have even sent a message to Sean the first time I, I saw it. I it may have been Sean, maybe it was somebody else, but basically I saw this great dashboard that was introduced in 2015 update one called the server side synchronization performance dashboard that gives no, you, yeah, yeah. Gives you metrics, you know, how many mailboxes have failed and all this great stuff. Except it will quickly, in a in a in an environment of any size, get too many sync cycle performance records, which are the these mysterious records that I have no idea where they live or what what they are. You can't get them for advanced find, but it gets to a point where you get too many records for the dashboard to display, and so you wind up with this fantastic dashboard, but three out of the four helpful charts say <laughs> you have exceeded the maximum number of records. <laughs> so that kind of takes away a little bit of the uh, benefit there. I think that dashboard is great if you have, I think, five users. I don't know. It seems like anybody above that, you exceed the maximum number of users, a maximum number of records. Five is a little low. <laughs> Another thing I, I uh, discovered, the mystery I had, was half the people I enabled worked were successful for both email and cat, contact the appointment task um, but then half of them were successful for email but not for cat and you know scratch my head on it what I found was uh, we had a custom security role and we were missing read permission to the mailbox to the email server profile and which was very strange to me because I would think if you didn't have read permission to that it wouldn't work at all but I'm telling you it worked for email but didn't work for contacts, accounts, and tasks. But once we got that ironed out, and that that's reinforcing that more and more, they, they're adding so much to these roles every release. I'm, I'm on the verge of making my recommendation that if you have custom roles, you recreate them 
each, you know, or, or seriously consider recreating them with a copy of a new out of the box rule because there's all these things you're going to miss. Well, now has hasn't that always been the kind of the best practice to to work off a copy of an existing rule so that you don't lose hidden privileges that are not necessarily on the surface. Yeah, it it is, it is, but it, it's hard when you have a bunch of them because nobody that Agreed. I know of uses the out of the box roles. So everybody has all these custom roles, and yeah, uh, okay. you know, recreating all of them and make sure, especially if you got a bunch of business units, making sure if you got them assigned correctly, you know, there's a hassle factor. I I do think if you're upgrading more than one version, like 2011 to 2016. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's, it's just pointless to try and save the roles you have. You're going to miss something. Agreed. I, I just kind of wanted to call that out in case there's anybody listening that has worked on a project with me and got annoyed when I made him do it. So, <laughs> Sean was absolutely correct to tell you to do that. I just, want, I just wanted the uh, validation there. There is something that uh, I, I did want to get both of your uh, take on. Recently, I've been working on a, the last couple projects that I've had, um, I've been working on 4.0 upgrades. And it's the, I guess it's kind of that, you know, when you haven't been around something for a little while and you, you kind of get that first initial shock of, oh, okay, let's remember what we have to remember here. Right. Um and doing things like, uh, and this is probably going to be more for, for George, given that Joel and I are not real developers, as George has cleverly noted many times on this podcast. Um, but doing things like using, you know, trying to diagnose the, the plugins and, and looking at, uh, you know, whatever code has been created for that implementation, you, you I found that you you know you have to go back and try to re- use a 4.0 plugin registration tool, which can have some some challenges to it. You may not get be able to get it to run anywhere for one. <laughs> right, right. Especially if you have like 2013, you know, Visual Studio 2013 or 2015. I really wanted to check to see you know how how have you guys worked around that and. What if there's if there's any kind of uh, ideas we can give our audience on how to prepare for that to make that transition a little bit smoother? My preference is to always get it upgraded to a to a more current version before you change any of that stuff. If it's 4.0, you know it's all going to have to be rewritten. If it's 2011 and it's not using the 4.0 endpoints, then you know maybe. And that's where Mitch Milam has some great, and other people like him have some great tooling you can use to evaluate, especially things like your JavaScript and you know translate mm-hmm. it to the new stuff. But yeah, George, so what's what's your take when you're doing an upgrade like from 4.0 to account for all the plugins? And sometimes you just have to do a Sherlock Holmes to inventory everything. Right. Um, technically speaking, uh, the recommendation is not to upgrade. Uh, that doesn't mean stay with four it means redesign Just right my, my question is really coming from I want to make sure I understand the full inventory of all the plugins that have been done so that I can evaluate where we need to recode or where has there been new functionality that does that would eliminate but the need I for it that kind of thing Looking at the plugin level, I would look at business functionality level and say, what is functionality? It doesn't matter how it's delivered because right. scripts are not going to run either. ISV folder is not going to run um, as well. So uh, none of CRM for developers' features are going to run. Mm-hmm. So to me, the best approach is to step back if you have business original business requirement documents use them as a starting point if you don't have those try to re-engineer functionality rather than trying to reverse engineer the code one of the things i i recommend is don't assume because they have it they want it too we had one recently where there was crm4 and went through and you know we 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 went down the recreate route or or re-engineer route because yeah, you know, there were also some limitations that prevent us from moving it 
but they had this customization in there that was old ISV add-on that is no longer in place. And you know, the assumption going in was, oh no, what did we do? And we just, you know, hey, gave them the gave them the facts. This doesn't exist anymore. We could rebuild it. It will cost you money to do so. And they said, oh, we don't right. need that. Right. And I'm expecting the same kind of response, but I'm I'm wanting to make sure that I have the full depth and breadth of what what was done. Um, the documentation isn't, you know, on the legacy implementation isn't what I would have would have hoped for. So, you know, making sure that I've, you know, lifted every rock to, to make sure that I understand what what's in the system. Because unfortunately, you know, I agree, George, uh, with your approach to, you know, talk about the business processes that that are taking place in 4.0 and in and redesign in that manner. But sometimes what happens. Uh, and this has happened a couple times to me. The folks that were in in charge or in control of those kind of decisions in a, in a 40 environment may not be there anymore. And if the documentation isn't there to support what was done, some of that's lost. You know, that's where that's where doing that you know Sherlock Holmesy kind of investigation uncovers things to make them say. You know, here's what you here's what you have. Are you still needing this kind of functionality? This is what it does. We'd have to rebuild it to Joel's point. So that it's it was it just seemed it just was interesting because it was fun going in the Wayback Machine and looking at 4.0. I mentioned Mitch Milam. His CRM Accelerators .net has one of the best things I've seen. Straightforward things about upgrading from CRM 4 and, and other versions, and he's got a tip, a tip on there, know your plugins, and has kind of a top three or four ways to do it, including using SQL Management Studio to get the plugins and their locations. There's a free utility he has linked there that I think is one of his, that is the Extract Plugins Utility. I compare you know those trips down memory lane, especially going to CRM 4 or even CRM 3, to I lived in a town... I haven't been there for 20 years. I go mm -hmm. back there, and it's like it looks familiar, it feels familiar, but all the all the things are different are in a different place than where I remember them. Right, the street right. layout isn't is 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 kind of foreign to me now. It's kind of like that. It's like this old place that I used to live, but now just feels so different. Yep, it was so cool at the time, thing, but just not the same. Yeah, the one thing that. Uh, uh, I keep telling, oh, a couple of things I, uh, I keep telling people who want to upgrade. Number one is that the data structures may still be valid and valuable. Right. Like reference data right. or <laughs> your contact data and relationships to other entities. Let's say you've got contacts, you've got timesheets, you've got projects, custom entities. Those entities and data in them still uh, have value. So extracting that and importing the data into the new developed structure makes sense. Uh, reference data probably go almost one to one, like country list or something like that. So there's definitely value in there. Uh, functionality, yes, you, you have to do some investigative work. You have to, if source code is not available, extract plugins, reverse engineer, um, pick the code, um, make a decision. Remember that it doesn't need to be a thorough analysis from what you're trying to achieve. Just by looking at plugin, you say, I think it does X. Uh, usually it's sufficient for the purpose of upgrade, go into business and say, this plugin seems to be doing X. Do we still need X um, or similar functionality? And then review it and uh, re-implement or perhaps use business rules or other functionality available like business process flows that change the way CRM functions. And that leads me to the second point. And the second point is that uh, it, it didn't change from CRM 4 to 2011, but it did change from 2011 to 13. Uh, the intent of the user interface changed. The paradigm changed. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was uh, your familiar menu on the left. Here's the list of places, a list of entities you want to go to. You go to the entity, you have a look at the list of things, you navigate, you open the form. It opens a different tab or different window. Um, before you know, you've got 16 windows on the screen. 
you're suffering and you have difficulties navigating. CRM 2013 changed that. They basically they said that look, instead of giving you the list of things to go to, how about the design by intent? We give you as much as possible on one screen. Uh, it's up to you to lay the information, um, to provide the information. That could be dashboard, could be form. Uh, there's a lot of information you can put into it. And then the, the idea is to reduce navigation. So if CRM 4 in 2011 were about making navigation easy to use and uh, consistent, in 2013, it changed to the point that is navigate as uh, to the place you want to go or you need to go in uh, as few click as possible right and the business process flows for example it's assisting you and it's changed the way business looks at those forms so suddenly you've got the concept particularly it's um, improved much improved in 15 and 16 the concept where the navigation between different entities can be effectively hidden from the user right remember you you have to create opportunity and if you didn't have the contact you had to enter the contact to save the record or open the opportunity look up create the new save put it there save the record so you were consciously creating records jumping between different screens now in 2016 now you can design a business process flow where you can go into the case uh, if contact is not there, you create a new case, it flows, it changes the form, it changes the underlying entity, it comes back to the uh, case, links the contact you just created, and perhaps you create a sales opportunity uh, in the same business process flows. And it changes the forms underneath without user realizing that they now working with the different entity. What I find difficult, for example, one that we just upgraded from 2011 to 2016, is it's very difficult to remember all the things that have changed, and there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of potential that users will get surprised by something, and it's things that we in the who are more cutting edge and implementing CRM 2016 all the time forget that this has changed since the version they have. Thinking about, for example, the print preview going away from the Outlook client where that was a big deal in the 2013 client, but that's been almost three years since since that release. So I forgot that that changed, and then right. we're rolling it out, and we got this group of users that likes to print everything saying, hey, wait a minute, where's my print preview? So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of interesting. And I find it's easier, and this, this is something that surprised me, it's easier for a user on CRM4 to adapt to 2016, in my opinion, than somebody who's on 2011 to adapt to 2016. And the reason is because 2011 changed a lot of things that then were kind of backtracked. Like the the busy ribbon came in with 20, 20, 30, 2011, and then it was taken away. Some of these things that changed in 2011 were then, you know, it's almost like some of this is more, more similar to 4.0 in some ways, than than uh, than it was in in 2011, so it's interesting. It's it's almost like an upgrade from 4.0 to 2016 is easier than going from 2011 to 2016. That's interesting. I never even thought of that, but that's yeah. I can see how that would be. Um, the only the only thing use the subgrids and the way the menus with the subgrids then changed. Where now we're going mm -hmm. from 4.0 to 2016. They've never had subgrids other than the custom kind of flaky custom ones that people did right and they love them <laughs> right and then, the, and then I guess the only I guess the biggest thing would be for them would be the lack of the tabs across the screen right. if they're really embracing those but wow okay and now that we got and, and, now that we got the the placeholders on the form back for the tabs similar kind easier. of functionality yeah so one, one other thing that I've, I've learned is that in some configurations the 2016 outlook client has shown to have some significant performance problems again i have see, i've tried it on multiple configurations and i find if you're using windows 8.1 or windows 10 with office 2013 the performance is pretty equivalent to what you had with 2015 but especially if you have older computers in the mix or you've got windows 7 in the mix or office 2010 my recommendation 
from the upgrades that we've gone through so far is test the 2015 Outing Outlook client and the 2016 Outlook client. Looking ahead to update.01, there are some performance uh, improvements that should fix some of these initial quirks with the Outlook client. But one lesson learned I have is uh, you know, if you are upgrading to 2016, do some real world testing. The other thing I take away I have is a lot of times we are given a test machine that is kind of a clean room PC or isn't a real user's PC. Um, best practice recommendation I have is make sure you're testing the Outlook client on a real user's machine or one that is in, in use with similar, similar characteristics of what your users are going to be doing and have real user types go through a day in the life because the user the performance issues that we've seen did not appear during that clean room testing kind of thing everything worked fine you clicked on views you open records that works fine but it's real world users and uh, in the, at least one scenario we've seen downgrading to the 2015 outlook client gave significantly better performance but that's you know it's it's a lot of times like that 2011 2013 2015 the very first release, there's always been certain things where especially Outlook client has had performance, you know, not as great as you want it to be, and it's usually quickly addressed in the first update rollup, first or second anyway. Yeah, I, I've, I've, always, I've always stressed having that, that additional uh, Outlook testing, it sometimes is difficult um, to have the, the right test environment to do it. I know back when I was a customer, we had our own set of lab PCs that we tested that kind of, uh, you know, deep testing in 4.0, but, um, you know, because, you know, I, I've had the, I've had situations where I've, do, where I've done that testing and accidentally downloaded all kinds of contacts into my phone and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, the testing is, is really important with the Outlook client. So here's, here's a question uh, kind of on the sync topic we've been talking about, and that is when you're using, when you're rolling out server-side sync, one gap I'm seeing is how do you effectively test it? Because follow me on this, when you when we traditionally have rolled out the Outlook client with Outlook, Outlook Sync, you have users and you configure the Outlook client to it and you test and they track emails and you make sure they track and all that stuff. And then you configure them against production and configure the Outlook client against it. And since the sync is, is tied to one organization, you know, it works. If you're rolling out server sync, how do you effectively test that in your non-production org and then move to production and cleanly, you know, because when you're syncing, you're syncing. So if you connect it to your production exchange, you know, you do it. Is it expected that you will have a total other, you know, exchange server with different users? Because real world, that, that doesn't always fit. You know what I'm saying? Because and then if you're if you're making changes in your non-production environment and that impact sync that you want to test things in, how do you effectively do that and have users switch between the two to to test that? What's stopping you from having test mailboxes? That would mean you would effectively need to use a, a non-user's computer to do your test on. Uh, right, or at least temporarily remove that exchange account and add the or add the that test exchange account to a user's computer. I guess that could work. Um, um, you can use multiple profiles; they're still available. Uh, okay. In, uh, we we had stayed away from that with the out when we used Outlook Sync because that w that didn't play well with multiple profiles. But I guess if you're doing server side sync, you could have you know an Outlook profile for your you know, for your sync, and that's one of the things with server-side sync. You can have multiple profiles and have them be syncing different ways since it's not tied to the computer. That's interesting. Well, well and, and now what about um, you? Know, you have like a, a a valid exchange account, which could be a, a shared mailbox, for example, where they're getting emails in to a valid email uh, address. You could use that, and and we, I did this once on 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 one project, we used that that account 
um, in the QA environment to test uh, the creation of uh, cases based on that email queue and then responding out uh, with an auto reply message and looking at the uh, mailbox on a PC uh, at the same time to, you know, to see if, if the messages were actually coming in and going out. And that seemed to work, but we didn't we didn't test it for uh, obviously for appointments and tasks and that that sort of thing. So it's not a complete test, but that that is one thing we did. Right. Yeah, and that's that's true. And what I'm what I've seen is sometimes the surprises come in when you're using server side sync. Even if it works right, there seems like there's always some some somebody who's not syncing right and something that's not adequately tested and i'm thinking that part of the reason for that is some of the extra steps necessarily to, necessary to adequately test it and uh you know so i think that's helpful so I, i'm i'm thinking george that the best practice would be like you said create a unique set of users and that would mean that you would need to have you know not mm -hmm. the same users i guess that could pr potentially present a challenge with with um, online, although you can pr you can give a mailbox for a user with online a different. A, here's the here's the challenge: if your email on your user is different than the email in your mailbox, that that can cause a problem. But I guess even if your email address was the same as you used to log into your production CRM online environment, you probably could create a mailbox that matches that other user account. Uh, one thing I've got notes to ask you about your adventures with your um, phone. Uh, what's the story uh, with you discovering new features of the phone? Yeah, so I've had my iPhone for a year, and it's a Verizon iPhone. And as people in the US with Verizon may know that, uh, you know, by default, it doesn't let you talk and use data at the same time. So if you're, my, the biggest pain is well, I would be using Waze in my car or some directional navigation app, and somebody from work like Sean would call me up and I would I would get lost. I have actually gotten lost and missed turns. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, trying to find my way to the uh, turn I wanted, and uh, the vice president of our company called me, and you always take calls from the vice president, and I I got where I was going like an hour late because I lost I I couldn't use data and talk on the phone. But what I realized, and you know, this is something that I don't think Verizon really wants people to know about. Otherwise, that they would turn it on by default, like AT and T does. But in the settings, in the cellular settings, you can actually, if you have an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus or 6S, you can change the setting for LTE to work for voice and data. And it has two benefits. One is your calls sound clearer. And I can attest to that because I talked to one of my colleagues who also turned it on, and she sounded significantly clearer. But also, um, the data will work well, because your voice will then go over LTE. And um, it's been great. I haven't gotten lost since people call me since then. What's the downside of switching it on? You know, I don't know. It doesn't. It, it apparently doesn't use any more data. Although the voice will go over LTE, it says your voice, you know, voice going over LTE doesn't uh, doesn't use any more data. I understand it's the same technology that AT and T is using on on iPhones. I really don't know. I mean, I could imagine maybe they don't turn on by default because it puts more more of a load on their data network but um, from a user standpoint it's at least the four or five days I've, since I've turned it on it's only been upside because you know, already I've had times where I mean I wouldn't even get text messages when my when I was on the phone and if I sometimes wow. in my role I'm on the phone all day and then my wife would ask me when I got home if I got her text she sent me that morning I said yeah I got it this afternoon because I didn't have a break from my phone calls so it's helping my marital bliss. It's helping me not get lost. It's a win-win-win. <laughs> I would just be yeah. very, very cautious and make sure you're looking at your bill. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Verizon. If if there's a way for Verizon to make money off that setting being turned on, they will do it. I use Verizon because no other carrier works at my house. I've had Sprint. Yeah. I've had AT and T. Some of them have worked better than others, but when I got to my house, it was like I couldn't get a signal. So that's why I use Verizon. Yep. 
So uh, let's um, talk I about. I checked the setting on my phone and it was on, and I always been wondering why. Why would I even want to have it off? Because the data speeds I'm getting on my phone is something to the tune of between 20 and 50 megabits, um, depending on where I am on 4G or same same technology. But um, I don't mind even even if it does take voice does take a bit of bandwidth. I don't mind sharing 50 megabits uh, with the voice data. So, um, well, here, here's, here's, you know, from my, from my perspective, one reason why it's important to me too is, uh, you know, I have times where I have to do a uh, Skype for business meeting and I need to show something, but I'm, you know, not, not when I'm presenting to a client, but if I'm talking to one of my colleagues and I need to show them something on my screen, I may be in my car driving to a meeting or, you know, going to pick something up or whatever and sitting in my car outside of my kid's school and like showing something and I find that Skype if I don't have a good if I you know I can have enough connection to show my screen if I'm not moving around a lot but to do that and voice sometimes it's it's too much so I you know we'll do a phone call for the voice part of it and uh, you know not being able to do that was a big limitation so this has already helped me with that so I don't I don't know what the what the downside is I've it's only upside so far. Um, let's talk about the tool and I have a tool and okay surprisingly so, we've got the same tool uh, okay. for this week. This is one I discovered with an interaction with somebody on the product team who wanted to set up a meeting co coincidentally to get my thoughts on on my experience with server side sync and I got this email from him saying Elad has has suggested these times for a meeting vote for the one you want it's this great tool that I never heard of called find time which is a Microsoft tool if you go to findtime.microsoft.com if you're on office 365 um, you can install this It's an office 365 app for Outlook and what it does is now if I'm meeting with Sean or Scott or somebody in my in my company, I can always check their calendar and create a, an invitation for a time that meet, works for all of us. But mm -hmm. if I'm meeting with George, like this podcast time, the way we came to the time for this podcast is you can send an send a meeting invite and suggest times and allow the other recipients to vote on it. And when the votes come in, then you can choose which one it gets sent out, and it'll automatically send the invite for you. So the the use case for it is these between me between company meetings where you're meeting with a client or meeting with somebody outside your company. It's great because before this, I've always you know had to do a call or send an email saying here's some times that work for me, what works for you, go back and forth. This gives you a nice clean way to share some options, have them vote, and I believe you can actually have it be automatic, like the ones that the most people vote for automatically get scheduled. I haven't gotten deep in, deep enough into it, but it's it's fantastic. Have you so played with George? I received an invite from you. Um, I think, yeah, that, that was my suggestion as well. Uh, and I'm just looking on my iPhone. You know, um, Microsoft uh, bought this application, the Outlook that you can see now. Um, in on iPhone that yeah. was bought by Microsoft some time ago, and with that did come schedule an application which has a special keyboard to send out those invitation choices. This keyboard has now gone from the phone, so I think it's the tool migrated to this fine time. The things like the Outlook app and things like this, these. I know that eventually these are supposed to show up on mobile as well. Is the venue for that going to be the Outlook app or the OWA app? I hesitate. I don't know. I use Outlook app uh, on the phone. Um, the app is extremely functional. I do the too. The other reason I'm using it is because I've got multiple email accounts and I find it much easier to manage multiple email accounts uh, in uh, Outlook app rather than have uh, web access pages like what uh, use four pages for different four email accounts. Right. Um, this way, I have one common inbox. I can, you know, archive. I can set up designated archive folders per mailbox. Um, I've got focused email, which I found extremely 
smart, so it's got this uh, ability to switch between uh, kind of two mini mailboxes. One is called Focus and Arthur, um, and it's extremely smart in picking up emails. Uh, let's say emails from you, Gerald, never go to Focus; they always go to Arthur. <laughs> and not to be I appreciate it. I I use it too. I like it. I like the email a lot. I like the uh, customizable gestures where you can control what the left swipe and right swipe give you, whether it's delete or archive or whatever. I'm not crazy about the calendar. I find the calendar lacks some fun functionality. Like it's hard to move. You, I don't even know if you can move certain types of meetings you know like if you've got a meeting that's a instance of a recurring appointment there's no way to move that so i've got to keep other apps like the oa app or the regular calendar to move them the biggest reason i don't use the standard calendar in, in ios is it cuts off invitations if you get a invitation like an invitation to a skype for business meeting it will cut it off if you accept it through the ios mail contacts is okay i still use the um, regular, so it's kind of weird. I've got my mail accounts that, that my contacts are set up with. I've got that set up through the regular account in the phone so that I can I can use Siri to say call Sean Tabor. But then I've also got it set up with this other thing. So it's it's kind of like you got to you got to get it set just right. So like I've got it set so on my normal accounts I've got contacts through my exchange account but I don't have my calendar because I don't want to get three or four notifications for every meeting. I actually find files very useful. Ability yes. to connect your Dropbox and one So joining us now is Ulrich Carlson. Ulrich is uh, with Provence. Dropbox, he's a example, senior CRM consultant and yeah, he's better good. known as like his it. alter ego, Great. the CRM cool. chart guy. Hello chart guy. All right. Thanks Joel. Hello. <laughs> so um, I, let me let me start by saying that I admire your blog very much because you have proven me wrong on multiple occasion on multiple occasions where I have said told my colleagues or whatever that a certain thing was not possible with the chart and then you you seem to right after that have a blog post saying how to do that exact things same thing with the chart. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, so I appreciate that. So how did you how did you decipher the mystery of the CRM charts? A good question. I think th this started like three four years ago, and I had a couple of projects where I had some some dashboards and charts I needed to work out, and I was very very tenacious about having them look exactly the way I wanted it. So I started digging into the chart XML and how to modify those and. And there was actually very little on the CRM blocks at the time on how to, to manage those. So there were a few blocks that kind of helped you got started, but there wasn't a whole lot. And as I was working it for a long time, I kind of started, you know, figuring out how this whole thing was put together. And that's why I started writing the, uh, the CRM chart guy block. Okay. And I kind of kept it, kept it at the, uh, the chart guy block just to make it easier, my, my blocking life easier. So I didn't really have to pick between all the different aspects of CRM. I was just focused on, on this one thing. Did you ever expect you'd be able to take it as far as you have? You have this blog that goes so deep into this topic. There's very little documentation on chart on the chart XML beyond just the basics. In the first couple of years when I was writing it, actually pretty much nobody was reading it, um, aside from a couple of people. Adam Vero included in, in the UK, he's an MVP in the UK. Right. And um, he actually gave me, I actually was thinking about giving it up, and he gave me some positive comments about, you know, writing more stuff. So that was what what kept me going at the time. And then people like just just picked up, and, you know, it's, it's a lot more fun to write blog posts when you know a lot of people are reading them afterwards. It seems kind of sad to me in some ways that there's so much, so much capability in there, but so little of it is really exposed easily through the front end. And, but if you do dig in, I'm thinking of some things on, grouping on option sets and some things that you've helped me tremendously with that just is not is not clear. Yeah, they made a lot of things very difficult in, in the UI. So you really, if you want to take full advantage of those charts, you really need to break open the XML and make some some edits, even if it's just to make them, them look nice. So you do have to go in and get your, uh, get your fingers dirty in, in a little bit of XML. Right. Um, which which can seem daunting to a lot of people, but I'm I'm not a developer myself. I consider myself more of a 
functional consultant, a business consultant. Um, so this is pretty much the only type of type of code I dabble in. Right. And I know that so, for for some of the things like the date formatting, it's almost like you it, you're more beneficial to study things like XML and .NET, and some of the some of the things are very consistent there with the charts compared to just uh, your typical CRM configuration. Yeah. So um. Yeah, it's, it's all about the the chart, specific, specifically the date formatting. That you don't have any options on, on changing the formatting on the dates on a regular chart. You have to make a lot of modification on it in order to be able to use like the standard date formatting. Say, I only want to show you know the three first letters of the month and then the the date. How well you want to put those together? You have to jump through a lot of hoops to make those those easy modifications. Right. Uh, I want to say easy, like it's something that's really easy in Excel, for example, but you have to jump through a lot of hoops to, to make it look right in CRM. Right. So uh, I, I asked some of my colleagues for you know questions to ask you since you are the chart guy. And uh, <laughs> one of them asked, what is your problem with funnel charts? I know you, you, <laughs> you had a pretty passionate uh, post or a tweet about what's wrong with funnel charts so what what is wrong with funnel charts so so the funny thing is that the people keep asking about the customers keep asking about funnel charts and like setting things up in the funnel charts and there's just a lot of things wrong with the funnel chart yet the analogy doesn't really make any sense because when you pour something into a funnel basically everything comes through at the end right right you're trying to display that things are actually dropping off for each phase um, Another issue with the funnel chart is that it doesn't display the data correctly. So you have a surface area in a form that, that if it's on the top of the funnel, can be of a lower value than one of the last phases, but take up a much bigger surface of the chart itself so it looks like it's bigger. Right. It, it, your perspective so really is off because you, you, the things at the top seem much bigger than the things at the bottom, even though they maybe are not. Yeah, so they're, they're very over overstated in, in the visual look of it. So so I, I took that as an opportunity to write a blog post, and, and I think the, the title was actually Funnel Chats Suck and You Shouldn't Use Them. <laughs> uh, but, but it's basically a, a long blog post about almost everything that you can do with a funnel chart in the XML and how give some tips on how you can alleviate some of those issues. Like how can you make sure that you know you don't get that discrepancy in, in the surface areas and and make the chart look more aligned. Right. So when you're talking to a to a sales manager or someone who wants the typical pipeline chart pipeline dashboard and wants to see see his forecast in a funnel chart, do you tell him no, you you should not use funnel charts. You say instead you should use this other type of chart. How do you how do you advise them? So I I think the end result that you you can you can you can make a funnel chart look decent, but that's really nothing you couldn't display in a column chart better. And specifically with CRM, if you use a column chart or bar chart to display those different phases, you can add totals and percentages and some other things to the chart that you can't do with a funnel chart. Right. Are, are you kind of thinking that as well? Because typically they're going to drill into that that part of the funnel and get to the bar chart anyway. So it's just taken out of step. Um, usually, um, I, I don't see uh, a lot of sales managers. I don't see them actually doing as much drilling. They kind of just like to get get everything displayed up front. So with a column chart, you do have a lot of more options to to add additional data. Funnel chart is is very limited in what you can do with it in terms of XML modifications. So ma so maybe that's why I have a little beef with with the funnel chart too. I think I think one of the things I have I've had to educate clients about too is they have certain visual goals that they want, but you really sometimes need to educate them about what the best picture or the best image to accurately relay the type of data they're trying to see is. So for example, people want a pie chart, but pie, if you're not showing percentages, is not really meaningful. If you just wanted to see who made the most calls today or that kind of thing, a bar chart or a, or a line chart are, are typically much better. Yes. People people have this vision of the of the pie chart, but especially people that aren't from a background of using Excel or, or playing with charts, 
a lot of times it's not it's not useful as well. What would you say uh, from your years of being the CRM chart guy? What are your I guess most popular chart tips from either number of views or feedback that you get? It's funny when you write a, a number of blog posts, the one that seems to be the most popular was not the one I expected. And that was actually a post I wrote a long time ago about adding totals to a stack bar chart. I remember that, that one. You build it in the UI and, and you know you have your stack bars and then you want a total at the top. You kind of have to eyeball it. So I wrote a, a long post about how to, to add those totals and that has actually been the most popular over time. Um, surprisingly, the the one when I when I meet people I get feedback on is when I wrote a blog post some time ago about how to create Gantt charts uh, specifically on start and end dates and different phases for opportunities so you can visualize those and kind of see how long opportunities are open and how long they open in individual stages. Uh, it's a visual representation, so no calculations, anything, anymore, but it gives you a good overview of where you are in the different. Uh, stages of the opportunities and how long they're open. Yeah, that's that's a good one too. I think I actually use that one too. I've used a lot of your a lot of your posts. One mistake I see people making a lot too is they think that they want a different charts for different ty- for different views. They think they have to make the same chart over and over and over again. They think I want a chart of I want a chart of my pipeline by stage for my strategic accounts. I also want one of my you know industry vertical and they think they need to make this make this chart over and over and it's kind of an eye opener that they say say no way you can make one chart and use it for whatever view you want yeah uh, that, that's one of the amazing features and it's actually a little puzzling that when you create a new crm trial or anything all the standard dashboards don't really include the option to change the view on the uh, on the charts themselves so mr hobb you got any chart questions well you know i what I was wondering, was what I was wanting to ask is, given that uh, we now are starting to get more and more data points that you could bring into CRM um, for for charting and dashboarding, um, are you seeing any particular challenges or any any changes in the product that is either making things that you've had to do in the past either go away or may, maybe making them even a little bit more difficult? Like for example, Power BI data. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and you know I've been keeping an eye on Power BI and seeing when, you know, should I kind of convert my blog into start writing about Power BI instead of the the built-in charts in CRM. One some of the things that I really like, and this might be for me specifically working services, is that you get direct access to the data in CRM. Right? You can do those drill throughs, you can click through to the the ticket or the case or the specific opportunity you want to work on right away. There are some benefits there. What's also interesting is that, that Microsoft haven't really updated the charting engine since 2011 or 2013. It's pretty much the same. So and kind of a good news, bad news for me is that all my old blog posts are still relevant. Nothing's really changed, but they also haven't given me anything new to to write about. There have been a few updates with the uh, the interactive service app and some of those new dashboards that's been coming out. There's a few extra features there, but Unfortunately, they don't really allow us to play with the XML yet on on those charts. So, so that's something we might be looking forward to in a future version. So it'll be interesting to see how they they go with the uh, the service up and those those dashboards there and those new chart types and see if we get any kind of influence on how those are present. In some ways, I think those charts look a little bit nicer, and I like how the drill through is handled on them as well. It seems like we've got two different types of charts in the system now, if you count that, and that that, that should be you know, standardized or unified in some ways. I also think that something that could springboard off of your topics there is also the Excel templates, because now that right. we've got the formatted Excel templates where we can have charts and things like that, that's, I, I think, a natural extension of what you do, being maybe the next level of charting is build an Excel template and use the more powerful chart capabilities of Excel. Yeah, and that definitely seems to be the direction that, that Microsoft is, is going with it, um, probably because they know that about the standard user, you know, they can already do all these things and, and manipulations in Excel um, that would take a person a long time to learn and, and creating similar dashboards or charts with uh, customizing the XML. So that, that's an interesting place to watch too. I think it won't be accessible to all users, I believe. Like some people won't have the option to 
export to Excel. So you're still going to need a certain amount of charts, at least what's relevant for people to drill through to to the work that they're supposed to to do right now, for example. Right. But you know, but you know, what wouldn't be awful is uh, maybe on your blog, maybe there's some uh, templates you can download that you might want to use for Excel that could mirror some of the things you've done in the uh, in the standard dashboards. That wouldn't be terrible, in my opinion. <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't hate it. Uh, okay, that's a good idea. I'll take notes. <laughs> so let's let's talk about you know when you're not when you're not wearing your CRM chart guy costume in your normal life, you are building solutions for enhancing SLAs for IT service providers. Am I, am I yeah, so understanding that right? We, yeah, we are in the ITSM space, so information technology service management. And so we are doing um, an advanced service management solution, all built inside CRM, service management and asset management. And I was actually just at Pink 16, which is the, the annual ITIL conference. ITIL is the Information Technology Infrastructure Library. It's uh, a set of a huge set of best practice processes on how to manage assets and services in an IT space. So I know it was interesting. I usually go to conferences like Dream CRM or Convergence where you, you open up the technology and you, you really dive into it. Yes, this conference was very focused on the theoretical approach on how to handle service management. Also interesting, like out of all the vendors descending there, about 50, 50 vendors, we were the only company with a solution built on dynamic CRM. There's some established IT service provider service management solutions out there. What are, what are the what are the main ones that the big ones in that industry? Yeah, you can see the, the main ones are PMC Remedy, uh, ServiceNow, CA Service Desk. Those those are the big people. PMC have a false remedy solution for Salesforce as well. So those right. are the big players in the in the ITSM or ITIL, ITIL space. Um, right. So you, you can see when, whenever you're looking at above standard case management, as soon as you're looking at more advanced service level agreements and operational level agreements, so when you have agreements inside your own company or with external partners, and including assets and tracking information and services on the individual asset as well, uh, that's when you're moving into the ITIL space and your competitors are ServiceNow and CA Service Desk. So we're, we're going above of what comes out of the box in the uh, the dynamic CRM solution. So that and that's exciting to see that because that that industry, I, IT service management, help desk management, things like that, that's a different animal than standard case management. And you know, if you you're just going in with standard CRM, that's not something CRM is really optimized for. It's great to hear that there's solutions like that that are enhancing it to make it a better fit for that kind of industry. Yeah, and it's kind of fun too, at least from, from wearing my Dynamics CRM hat. I've been working with Dynamics CRM since, since version 1.2. So it's kind of fun to be the only Dynamics CRM player in, in this area, at least for the time being. I don't know if anyone else is, is planning on it. But it's interesting to play against ServiceNow and BMC Remedy and those and kind of represent the, the Dynamics CRM platform at the same time. Right, and there's got to be a value a value proposition there for a lot of those companies are probably using a more traditional CRM application or even dynamic CRM for other parts of their you know sales, marketing, etc. And especially if, if that's the case, there's a value in having fewer systems or having have them be able to work together that way. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wonder what we see some some of our competitors like ServiceNow are doing is that they're building all those marketing solutions, they're building all those project management solutions, which, you know, with all the ISVs in, in the dynamic space, it are solutions that you can just add to, to CRM um, and get all those additional features. So is there is there an overlap at all with what you're doing with some of the new service stuff with, with Field One, especially for people that have field equipment or assets? So I, w- I would say it's more complementary to the Field One solution, and also be- being in a space where, where Microsoft uh, uh, is continually evolving uh, on the case management and ticket management, we also have to stay ahead of the game, not just on, on what our competitors are doing, but also make sure that we stay ahead of the game of, of what Microsoft is bringing out of the box, right? I think that's the life of being a, an ISD on, on dynamic CRM. Again, a good example is we've had uh, SLAs in our, in our solution for over five years now. Um, which just came recently in, into CRM. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. When does it make sense to update our SLAs and use the built-in ones instead? So um, ours are still more advanced, but you know, eventually 
I'm sure Microsoft will get to a point where the SLAs are just as advanced as, as what we see with our competition or make more sense to use those instead. So you have those fees. Some, some that's a little bit of redundancy. We try to stay ahead of the game. So there can be some fear out there, especially in the ISV community, that Microsoft continues to encroach in these areas that traditionally have been ISV solutions for. But I think the ones that are best suited are the ones that are more industry specific rather than just general solutions. It's the general, you know, general mobile clients or solutions for field service that they're, you're most at risk. But if you if you are more specialized, Microsoft isn't really getting into the industry solutions so much. And so I think there's definitely still is room there. But you need to differentiate yourself. You need to, you know, have have a real value there instead of just being, you know, just a commodity. Uh, function. Absolutely, and that's where we see Dynamics CRM is focusing very much on, on the standard case management or ticket management, as you would call it in, in the ITIL space and the service desk, whereas ITIL and ITSM and asset management is a much bigger monster, and they don't really seem to be headed in that direction. Right. But but definitely improving a lot on, on the standard service desk and service management, ticket management features. Where can listeners find out more about your offerings for that area if they have IT help desk or IT service uh, requirements? The, the first place would be Provence.com. Provence, okay. P-R-O-V-A-N-C-E. If you see the website, and, and definitely feel free to contact us to get a demo. I, I think where it would be relevant to, to talk to us is when you see people looking for a service management solution that includes uh, assets, uh, includes ITIL certifications. That's a requirement on a lot of um, IFPs. That it needs to be ITIL certified, and our solution is ITIL certified on a number of processes. And look at that. All of your competitors are companies like ServiceNow, BMC Remedy, actual ITIL service management, ITSM service solutions. Well, Ulrich, I appreciate you joining us. Do you ever write about anything other than charts? If you do, where, where would where would who would you write so, that? Occasionally, it doesn't happen as, as often. I do see myself writing a lot more about the service management space and best practices on how to to configure the, the service management, particularly from an ITIL perspective, to get some of the KPIs more aligned than they are on CRM right now. Um, what I've written in the past has been on my Alpha People uh, blog. Um, I used to work for Alpha People, um, a huge consultancy, particularly in, in, in Europe and South America. They're not as big in the States yet. Um, I've written some posts there on, on using dialogues and querying data in dialogues. Um, I've been written some, some posts about the concept of escalations in, in a service management setting. But that won't be on the chat guy blog. I'm kind of keeping that as my, that's my hobby. Um, that's what I, when I need to have some fun blogging, I, I write on the uh, CM chat guy blog. Yeah, so, I like your, I like your recent post about the bubble chart. Oh, thank you. That's one of those things that I would have just said, there's no way to do that. <laughs> and you, you have the complete instructions there, so that's great. Yeah, so hopefully I can keep doing that. I, I still have a number of blog posts I just need to write. And, and interestingly, I think next on my list is actually writing a, a basic CRM chart editing overview. If you'll believe, I've actually never written, written one of those. Um, so basically just an overview of uh, the XML, where you change what, what kind of differences it makes. Um, Basic overview uh, that I can put on my, my blog, too. The guide that Microsoft should have written to begin with. Yeah, exactly. This has been CRM Audio, the Microsoft Dynamic CRM podcast. You can hear previous episodes on our website, crm.audio. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at CRM Audio. Or leave us a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash CRM podcast. If you have any topic suggestions or questions that you would like for us to answer on a future episode, please drop us an email at voice at crm.audio. Special thanks to Dale Simmons for our theme music. Go check out his website, dalesimmons.com. Please join us next time on CRM Audio.